I told him so. Yes, yes. Hi, everyone. So, thanks for coming tonight. I'm Susan James, um, assistant director here at Bayless, and welcome to another evening uh, here at the library. I want to thank Steve Lado for speaking tonight and friends of the library for their usually good refreshments, very good refreshments. We're very pleased to have Steve Lado back with us tonight. He has a degree in history from Oakland University and a law degree. He has ties to the Finnish community in the UP. In 2007, he was here and he spoke about Death's Door as part of the Library of Michigan's notable book tour. Since then, he's done further research on the Italian Hall disaster and the strike of 1913. He'll speak tonight about his newly expanded edition of the book that's available for purchase and signing. Please welcome Steve Lado. That's what I was asking you about your book, because the new one's thicker. <laughs> um, thank you. Can we do one of the lights or no? We're getting there. Oh, there we go. It's a multimedia experience. Um, if you go to Calumet today, this is all left of the Italian Hall. Uh, it's on 7th Street, um, and it's, it's uh, the arch that they take in the building. And many of you are familiar with the story of the Italian Hall disaster, and what's particularly important is that this year is the 100th anniversary of the strike of 1913 and of the Italian Hall disaster itself. So this Christmas Eve will be 100 years since this happened. And what happened was there was a party being held for children of striking miners in Calumet, Somebody ran into the party and disrupted it by yelling fire at the top of their lungs in the English language, caused a panic, and 73 people died trying to get out of this building. So uh, we'll try to explain and understand what happened there that night and what could lead you to the point where someone could yell fire in a crowded theater, kill 73 people, and get away with it, because that's what happened. So this is the Italian Hall as it looked in 1913, and you'll notice this is the arch I just showed you that they preserved, and it does say Italian Hall on the side here, but the building was a multi-purpose building, so the top floor was the hall, a meeting hall, and there was uh, a stage up there and a, a room where you could have a banquet or uh, some kind of celebration. Um, and then on the bottom right-hand side, the Greater Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. People my age and older would know the A&P stores. Um, and on the left-hand side is Viro's Saloon, and Viro uh, was a very well-known Italian family that ran that saloon. Um, and in fact, there are still Viros who live up in the area who are descended from the people who are running the bar the night of the Italian Hall disaster. And we'll talk about that uh, as well. And um, the Italian Hall is also known as a very uh, popular place among union members. So in 1913, though, the area was known as the Copper Country. And many of you would know this, and, and most people in, in northern Michigan know this that the Keweenaw Peninsula uh, was a great producer of copper. And copper not only was common, but it was also common in its native form. You can actually take a walk up there now and find pieces of copper laying on the ground. But copper was so uh, ubiquitous up there that um, the copper mines were huge. They took over the area. But copper mining was dangerous, extremely dangerous. And so this is a good photograph from right around that time. And technology was changing around that time. That played a small role in what led to the unions, but wasn't that big of a role. You notice the man on the right is using the high-tech thing we call a, um, uh, a bar. He's prying rock off the ceiling. The man on the left is using a drill, uh, a pneumatic drill. Um, and the interesting thing about the miners at the time, how dangerous it was, is that on average in 1913, 1912, there was one death per week in the mines. So every single week, week in, week out, one man would die in the mines on average. They'd be killed by falling rock, they'd get killed by uh, being crushed by things, hit by things, falling down mine shafts. And they were so commonplace that you'd see a newspaper report that would say, yesterday another Finlander died in the mines, and wouldn't say what his name was. Uh, it might not even mention which mine he died at, or how he died. Uh, extremely common. And then for each man who died, another 10 would be seriously or grievously injured. And I'm talking about injuries back when men were men. So a grievous injury in 1913 might mean you lost a leg or an arm or fractured your skull and, and, and might not be able to work ever again. Or if you could work, you might get put in a shop where they have special jobs for you because you were in essence handicapped. 
for every 10, uh, for, you know, 10 of those for every death, and then probably 30 or 40 minor injuries, talking about uh, breaking bones, breaking fingers, losing fingers, things of that nature. Extremely, extremely dangerous work, and also extremely grueling work. So uh, this man here is pushing what's called a tram car. All day long, he's a trammer for 10 hours a day. He's pushing loads of rock, and um, this guy right here is actually what was happening in the mines in 1913 for the most part. You could get a job in the mines in 1913 if you simply showed up and were able-bodied. You didn't need a skill and you didn't need to speak English. So the area was a magnet for immigrants who needed jobs. A lot of Finns, a lot of Croatians, Italians, Hungarians, and so on. And so you had a lot of these guys that show up in the mines with no skills, no, no ability to speak English, but it didn't matter. All day long, pushing these rocks. Uh, one of the amazing things, though, about this man here is he's being paid by the pound. Literally, he's being paid by the pound of how much rock he pushes. The Department of Labor came into the area in later years to try to figure out what led to the strike of 1913. And one of the things they discovered was that despite the fact that all the mines paid trammers by the pound, not a single mine in the QAnon actually had a scale on its premises. Every single one of these men was paid by what his boss thought his rocks looked like they weighed. And so there's a lot of friction between mine management and the lower levels of workers in the mines. Dangerous work, grueling work, and probably being underpaid. So along comes the Western Federation of Miners. And this is the first group that's extremely important to the story. Western Federation of Miners have been out west. They've managed to unionize. They've managed to, to get a lot accomplished out west. They brought a reputation with them, unfortunately, of, of a little bit of violence. Um, but when they came to town, 1912 and 1913, and started unionization efforts and, and a drive to unionize the members, they got some very good results. Uh, number one, the conditions in the mines were bad, they were difficult. Number two, a lot of the workers in the mines had come from countries where unions and socialists were actually considered acceptable. America was not at that point yet. Unions were still unusual in America. Big business hated them. And so there was a clash set up that's going to happen between big business and the unions. So the Western Federation of Miners comes to town and starts working on union, unionizing efforts. Uh, this is a famous photograph of three men. Uh, Pettibone, Haywood, and Charles Moyer on the far right. Charles Moyer is the one who came to the copper country to organize, but it's important to see these three men in this one photograph because you'll notice that they're standing uh, or sitting uh, outside of the sheriff's office where all three of them have been arrested for the murder of Frank Stunenberg, the former governor of Idaho, who had been blown up with dynamite in his front yard. And a man named Harry Orchard had gone to the police and said, I know who did it. I did it. And these three guys put me up to it. So they put Pettibone on trial, he was acquitted. They put Haywood on trial, he was acquitted. They dismissed charges against Moyer. Despite that, when Charles Moyer showed up in the Q&A, the mine management barked every time they could get someone's attention and said, these violent murderers have come to the Q&A to organize workers. And they, these guys are, are criminals, and they're evil, and they're bad. When in reality, yes, the unions had caused some trouble out west, but they certainly weren't murderers because none of them were convicted. Uh, as a side note, I should point out to you that Big Bill Haywood here later wrote a book called Big Bill Haywood's Book. And <laughs> he's also looking to his right, and in any photograph you find of him, he's looking to his right because he's missing his right eye. He lost it while whittling as a child, and I'm not making that up. So uh, that's Big Bill Haywood. Charles Moyer, though, is the guy who comes to town. And Charles Moyer comes in, and one of the things that the Western Federation of Miners did brilliantly is they organized different and disparate groups of immigrants who didn't speak the same languages. And one of the things that the unions uh, did uh, that mine management never thought they could do was get people who spoke Italian, people who spoke Croatian, people who spoke Finnish to all get on the same page and join a strike. So in uh, the midsummer of 1913, the union uh, asked its membership uh, do you authorize us to approach mine management and ask them if they'll negotiate with us as a single bargaining unit? And if they refuse to negotiate with us, do you authorize a strike? There were approximately 10 or 12,000 union members in the q and at the time who voted overwhelmingly to strike. Some strike vote numbers were approaching 98% saying, yes, negotiate for us, and yes, we will strike if they won't talk to us. Well. They sent the letters to mine management, said, we want to talk to you. Mine management didn't respond to the letters. 
my management took the position that simply responding to the letters would be some tacit admission that the unions have got a right to exist and my management had always taken the position that the unions cannot negotiate on behalf of other people. In other words, my management will negotiate with you, they'll negotiate with you, they'll negotiate with you, but they won't negotiate with someone else for your labor. So the uh, my management refuses to talk, so the people go out on strike. So this is uh, sometime after July 22nd or 23rd, and like I said, this is the 100th anniversary of the strike, so a hundred years ago, the strike started already, a couple weeks ago. At that point in time, a strike uh, picket, instead of actually going out and picketing the site of a, of a workplace, like we actually think of the, like say the big three in Detroit, when the UAW goes on strike, they might all stand around a plant and try to cease, stop production at a particular plant. You can't do that in the copper country because the workplaces are so scattered. There's mines, there's rock houses, there's dry houses, there's smelters, there's tool shops. <laughs> and they're scattered all up and down the entire peninsula. So what they would do is they'd go out on the street and they would parade, usually around the time of a shift change. So if you dared to go to work uh, tomorrow morning, you've got to run past these people here carrying your work bucket. And you're probably not going to want to do that. So by having these mass demonstrations in the street, they managed to shut the mines down, and the mines did shut down. They shut down completely. There was literally no rock being lifted in uh, the last week of July, 1913. And the um, uh, interesting thing is that the mines had seen the strike coming, they knew it was coming, they were anticipating violence. There was virtually no violence at the beginning of the strike. And even Jim McNaughton, who wrote letters to his bosses back in Boston describing what happened, was kind of shocked and admitted there was no violence. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, among the important people in the strikes, a woman named Big Annie Clements, and this is her right here. I like to point her out because, among other things, a very good book was just written by a guy named Lyndon Comstock, and it's available at various bookstores and Amazon and so on, uh, about Big Annie. Just look up Big Annie. Uh, and it's amazing because up until recently, we'd only known Big Annie from the strike. It's like she appeared the morning of the strike and disappeared at the Italian Hall. And Big Annie played an extremely important role, but what was shocking about it was the fact that she's a woman. and. At that time, women were not involved in a whole lot of anything outside of the house. She was married to a minor who was on strike, and we never hear anything about him. We always hear about her. They called her Big Annie because she's six foot two. I'm six one and a half, so she's a half inch taller than I am. Now, this is a very famous photograph, and I'll point out some things to you. Number one, standing next to her is a guy named Ben Goggin. Ben Goggin was an Italian labor organizer. So when the Western Federation of Miners held a rally, they would often have a guy get up and give a speech in English, exhorting everyone to go on strike or to stay on strike. Immediately after me would come Ben Goggin and give the exact same speech in Italian. And then immediately after him might come Big Annie to give the exact same speech in Croatian. And that's one of the things they did. They did a very good job of translating these messages over and over to the different ethnic groups to keep everyone together as a cohesive unit. One of the things that the mines always expected was that there's going to be infighting among these groups and it never happened. So um, this is a great photograph because Big Annie's got her finger bandaged. And we think this photograph was taken the day of a famous incident where Big Annie was uh, leading a parade of strikers uh, from Red Jacket to Yellow Jacket. And, and I like to tell people that the mines were putting up towns so fast they ran out of time to name them. So there's also a town called Blue Jacket not far away. And as the uh, strikers encountered the National Guard who'd been called in, the National Guard tried to stop the strikers, and of course the strikers have every legal right to be in the roadway. The National Guard, acting on bad orders, tried to stop them, and somebody uh, using a saber or a sword knocked Big Annie's flag out of her hands. Big Annie was often leading parades with a 10-foot tall flagpole on a gigantic American flag. Knocked the flag out of her hands and cut her finger. And Later, the National Guard denied that it happened, despite the fact there were hundreds of witnesses to the incident. Big Annie famously said, at the moment the flag was knocked out of her hand, she picked it back up again and said, go ahead and run your saber through me. If this flag can't protect me, nothing can. And they'd always denied that it happened, but then here we have a photograph, and like I said, she's got her finger bandaged. She's obviously not hurt badly, but there is a National Guardsman in the back keeping an eye on her just in case. <laughs> so that's Big Annie. She's one of the important people in the story. The National Guard was called, and they were called largely because local businesses, goaded by the mines, wrote letters to Woodbridge, Ferris, and Lansing saying that the situation is completely out of control up here. We need the National Guard. 
The National Guard had been used very efficiently by other mines out west. And the National Guard would show up someplace, and if they would do the bidding of the mines, would often put down a strike. Well, the Michigan National Guard showed up, but wouldn't take sides. And so after a month or two, the National Guard simply got sent home. But they were here for a while. They weren't necessarily a stabilizing force, but they also weren't an agitating force. So it's an interesting thing. If you hear about the stories out west, there's some horrible, horrible things that had happened. Uh, like Ludlow, for instance, that involved National Guards, uh, and, and it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. So um, we have these parades that are going on all, all, all uh, summer long. This is another good photograph of a parade, you'll notice the Italian Hall is in the background. This is a photograph that was not taken of the Italian Hall, per se, but of just a typical parade during the strike. But you'll notice how jam-packed the Italian Hall is. It was a very well-known uh, pro-labor place. Um, a lot of union activities were held there, union, union rallies and so on. You'll see all the people in the windows upstairs, people on the staircase, and people in the, in the doorway to the saloon. Um, so the Italian Hall was, was often a focal point of, of the uh, union activities. So another group of people that's extremely important to understand that plays into the story is the replacement workers. And um, during the strike, the mines are shut down, the strikers won't go back to work. So mine management starts hiring replacement workers. And what they did is they sent recruiters to Chicago and New York, down to the docks, and said, look, just start rounding people up and ship them up here, and we'll give them jobs. So you get paid $275 per shift if you show up at the strike zone. Um, and this is done in October, of course, 1913. But you'll notice that you're being advanced money and so on, so when you show up, you'll be in debt. And then um, this is all been explained to you in the English language, despite the fact you probably don't speak English. And you show up, and you'll get put to work in the mines. And a lot of replacement workers showed up, but despite their presence, they still couldn't get the mines running full capacity. So the mines, some of them were kind of operating, but not full capacity. So the mines are limping along. This is a good photograph of some uh, imported men in a bunkhouse. Uh, you can count all you want. I think it's about 20 or 30 men there. And many of the imported men would later testify to Congress that they were kept in these bunkhouses under armed guards. Uh, by armed guards. And when they asked, why do you have armed guards keeping us in our bunkhouse, they said, oh, we're doing it for your protection. And this one man in particular later testified to Congress that he was being kept under armed guard for his own protection. And one day he said, well, I want to leave. And they said, no, you don't want to leave. And he said, no, I want to leave. And he tried to leave. And they grabbed him and dragged him back. And he tried to leave again. And they grabbed him and dragged him back. And finally, they dragged him back. And he insisted on speaking to somebody's manager which is what you do today when you have trouble, you know, on the phone. So he um, says, I want to talk to managers. So they bring him to a manager, and, he, and the guy says, why do you want to leave? Why are you, why are you causing trouble? And he says, well, I don't, I don't want to work here anymore. I'm not happy. I should be allowed to leave. This is America, right? And the guy says, well, if you leave here, you're going to get arrested. So take your pick. And the guy says, well, I don't know what I'll get arrested for. So he left. He left, and he wound up in jail. And he testified that he wound up in jail, and he didn't know why. And he spent 30 days in jail, and then he got released. And it's one of those stories that when I first read it, I thought to myself, that's such a strange story. I wonder if it's true. And later on doing research, I actually found a list of all the arrest records from 1913. And I found the man's name in there. And he's arrested for violating the Red Jacket Noise Ordinance, and for which he, was, he spent 30 days in jail. And I don't know if the violation was that he was complaining too loudly or if it was the sound that was being made as people punched him. But he spent 30 days in jail because he didn't want to work you know, under, under armed guards. Uh, as a replacement worker. So, the other group of people that's extremely important to the story of those, Waddle Mahon, is a company in 1913 that is a strike breaking company. Nowadays, there's no such thing as a strike breaking company. Nowadays, we call these people uh, like a security company or a guard company. But back in 1913, Waddle Mahon would actually approach businesses who were having labor problems and say, if you'd like us to, We'll supply you people to uh, guard and protect your property and to put down a strike. They would actually tell you that they could end your strike for you. Now, if you think about this, you've got workers who don't want to work for you. You can't convince them to come back, but here's a third party that can come out and do it for you. It's a very strange concept. But the most interesting thing about this is they brag as evidence of our ability that they are currently working on behalf of these mines in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan with Cali and Hecla. But they brag in this letter that here we are hired not by the mines, but we are hired by the county. <coughs> the government hired the Wild Mahon Corporation. And that's the strange thing about the strike that a lot of people overlook. 
is that when the strike was called, and there's a standoff, Jim McNaughton, who was the head of the Kelly Met and Heckler Mine, was also the head of the Board of Supervisors for the county. And so the first time the county met with its Board of Supervisors in 1913, after the strike was called, Jim McNaughton said, I think we should hire strike breakers to put down the strike. And he actually got the rest of the county board to go along with him. So the county hired strike breakers to go in and put down the strike. And now that is extremely, an extremely weird use of taxpayer money. Uh, and I, I don't know really how you justify that because they are clearly there at the behest of the mines to do battle with the union. And they're being paid for by the county. So the strike breakers show up and they come to town and they get sent out and say, okay, go out and patrol mine property and protect the property and do what you can to break the strike. What that often meant was they would often beat people up. This is a famous photograph. Believe it or not, the man in the photograph is being beaten up, was arrested. And he's probably arrested by the strike breakers. Because along with being strike breakers, many of the strike breakers were deputized, which was completely illegal. But under 1913 law, if you were a resident of a county for 90 days or more, and you were law abiding, you could be deputized. They give you a badge and a gun, and the law said that if you were accompanied by an actual employee of the sheriff, you could help that person do their job. Well, when the strike breaker showed up, they give him a badge and a gun and say, you're a sheriff, deputy, go out and do your job. They wouldn't tell him these little nuances of the law, and so many of them would go out and just enforce the law as they saw fit. Many of them had never been to Michigan before, had no idea about Michigan law, they didn't know who the sheriff was, they didn't care. They just go out and say, oh, here's a striker, let's beat him up. And this photograph is captioned on the back and it says three strike breakers uh, arresting a striker. And when this photograph was shown to the judge, the judge threw the charges out according to the caption on the back of the photograph. Um, don't know if that's true or not, but it's indicative of what's going on. So here's the, the badge that they would give somebody and say, congratulations, you're now a deputy sheriff. And they wouldn't, like I said, tell you necessarily what the job entailed. And the important thing is that in 1913, the unions had very good legal representation. And they had their attorneys go to court and ask the judge specifically on this issue, are they allowed to deputize strike breakers? And the, the judge said, absolutely not. He said, the strike breakers can go along with the sheriff's deputies, they can help the sheriff's deputies, but under no circumstances are they actual sheriff's deputies. So one of the things that you see if you read a lot of the stories about the strike is people will talk about sheriffs did this and sheriff's deputies did that, and they're blurring these distinctions between who is actually a sheriff's deputy and who was a strike breaker who may be carrying a badge that he shouldn't have been carrying. So one of the stories that we like to point to about the strike was the first real violence that broke out in a little town called Seberville, which is near a town called Painsdale. And I know people who are not familiar with the area don't understand that when I say Seberville is a suburb of Painsdale. Um, I'm not really reflecting how big Seberville is, but um, there's two, uh, a group of strikers who walked from Seberville, which is a, board, a, a little group of boarding houses in a little hollow, and uh, they walked from Seberville to South Range, probably a couple mile long walk along some train tracks. They went to look for the strike benefits this August uh, of 1913, and when they were in town in, in, in South Range, they um, spent some time there and they turned around and they walked home. And on their walk home, they stopped at this building. This is actually in um, Painsdale. It was in South Range Mercantile. You notice it does say Painsdale Post Office. Um, that building got torn down in the 60s. That spot, I know where that spot is, and, and you can go there today and see that there's actually a train platform behind this building that you can still find today. And these two men went inside the mercantile there and bought a couple bottles of pop. And um, then when they're done, they continued walking towards Seberville. And on their walk, they encountered a man named Humphrey Quick. And Humphrey Quick was an employee of the mines who was not on strike. He's a mine management person of some level, above, above ground type guy. Uh, and Humphrey Quick encountered these two Croatian strikers. And he said to them in English, you cannot walk across this path. And the two Croatian strikers who did not speak any English tried to convey to him in Croatian. that They didn't understand what he was saying. But They've walked this path all the time. They understood there's something going on about this path, this path. And the path was a straight line from this store to their boarding house in Seberville. So they went past Quick and just continued on their way. Quick went and found his boss, a guy named Schott, S-C-H-A-C-H-T, but all the C's and H's are silent. And they went and found Schott, and Schott said, you know something, bring those two men to me and I want to talk to them. Schott was actually raised by parents who spoke German but born and raised in America, went to Michigan Tech, and was bilingual, obviously. 
and understood that these two Croatian workers who didn't speak English might not have understood English. So um, Schatz said, go find those men and bring them to me. Quick, worried he's gonna go try to get two men from Seberville, and he's gonna be outnumbered two to one, <clears throat> grabs a couple strike breakers and two men who've been deputized, but they do not have any actual sheriff's deputies with them. So the two men who've been deputized are not actual deputies, and the four strike breakers are simply thugs from New York and Chicago who've been brought into the area to cause trouble. Six men go to the boarding house at Seberville looking for the two men who crossed the property. If you go to Seberville today, this is pretty much all you'll see is this sign and a few houses. And they went to this house here, which is no longer standing. And this was the Putrich boarding house where the two men lived who cut across the property. They'd actually gone inside, eaten dinner, and when they were done with their dinner, they were in the side yard here playing a lawn bowling game that involves this stand, and I don't understand it myself, but they were standing out there, and one of the strike breakers named Thomas Raleigh asked Quick, is or are the men you're looking for in this group of men here? And <clears throat> Quick said yes, Right there, that's the guy we want. So the uh, group of men, six of them, jumped this fence with guns drawn and tried grabbing this one guy. And they grab him, they start beating him up. But the problem is they've jumped into a yard filled with Croatians who are all related to each other. And they don't know why this guy's being beaten, but he's their friend and or their relative. And so they help him get away. And the two men, managed to get inside the house. And one of the gunmen, and I'll, for clarification purposes, the bad guys are gunmen, and the good guys are people who live here. <laughs> one of the gunmen follows around the back of the house, his name's Cooper. Cooper's got a gun, and Cooper gets scared because he suddenly finds himself surrounded by Croatians. So Cooper takes his gun and turns around and shoots the first person he sees, and he shoots again Steve Putrich in the abdomen. Steve Putrich had nothing to do with either fight. He wasn't on the trail that day. He wasn't even in this side yard. He was simply the brother of the landlord. Steve Putrich gets shot, but the problem is that the gunshot comes from behind the house over here. The other gunmen, hearing a gunshot, all freak out and do what untrained thugs do when they've got guns in their hands and, they, and they're scared. They all start shooting into the house. All of the gunmen empty their guns into the house 25 or 30 shots of ammunition expended, perforating his house, shooting it all up. Two men die, two other men are injured, and a uh, baby being held by its mother is powder burned in the face because Cooper, the gunman, had actually gone into the house and has chased a man in the house, was shooting, standing literally in the kitchen, shooting into the dining room inside the house and the, and the mother of the house actually ran by him to get out of the house with her baby in her arms. After the shooting takes place, um, and this is um, Steve Putrich on the left, that's Louis Tijon on the right, um, the first two <coughs> martyrs of the strike. And um, uh, after this shooting takes place, the gunmen just get up and leave because they don't think they're going to get in trouble for this because as strike breakers you don't get in trouble when, as long as you're only injuring strikers. And the first person to show up on the scene who's important is a guy named Anthony Lucas. And Anthony Lucas is the prosecutor for Houghton County. And strangely, he's one of the few uh, uh, immigrants or descendants of immigrants to get elected with a funny last name. Most of the people in Houghton County government are, you know, the O'Briens, the Smiths, the Johnsons. Uh, and Anthony Lucas was an attorney though, got himself elected prosecutor. He shows up at the Croatian boarding house and interviews these people in their own language. And he hears what happened and he decides he's gonna prosecute uh, the gunman. And he winds up prosecuting them and eventually gets convictions on uh, four of them, uh, which is in and, of, in and of itself, it's a miracle. But this story becomes very, very important because number one, it shows the level of, uh, or lack of control on the level of the strike breakers and, and what kinds of things they'll do and think they can get away with during the strike. <clears throat> but another extremely important thing happens at, the Ital uh, at, at this, that ties into the Italian Hall disaster. The coroner uh, comes in and does an inquest for the deaths of Steve Putrich and Louis Tijan. And after he does the inquest, he concludes that these two men were murdered. And at the inquest, he calls witnesses. And I often joke that the gunman who shot at the Putrich boarding house used extremely bad judgment because they decided to shoot up 
a boarding house in broad daylight on a hot summer afternoon, half an hour after dinner, with about 75 or 100 witnesses who spoke four different languages and often didn't know each other. So next door on one side of the house is the Italian boarding house. The other side is the Hungarian boarding house. And across the street is a Finnish boarding house. And any judge will tell you when three witnesses get on a stand who don't speak a common language and they all tell you the same story, they're all telling the truth. There's no way that a Finnish, pers Finnish person, an Italian person, and a Hungarian person who don't speak each other's language can possibly conspire to get their story straight. So they're all telling the truth. And they all said, yeah, we saw Cooper going to the house to shoot it up. Other gunmen went nuts. And the two Croatians who died did nothing to deserve this. So at the inquest, to get the testimony in, they actually brought in interpreters. Five interpreters were used at the Sieberville inquest. <coughs> Later, at the Italian Hall disaster inquest, they would not use any interpreters at all. And if you didn't speak English, they'd still ask you questions in English and make you answer in English. Because they didn't want to find out what happened. But we'll get to that in a second. So the Sieberville inquest becomes something that we engage this against. The other group that plays into the story is the Citizens Alliance. And there was this group that suddenly appears in December of 1913 called the Citizens Alliance. <clears throat> and I always would point out that the punctuation changes because here there's an apostrophe, there there's not. And often they put it in the other spot too. But the Citizens Alliance was this group that suddenly appears out of nowhere. And as it turns out, it was founded by and funded by the Mayans. <coughs> Jim McNaughton decided that you know, the, the, the union's getting all this great publicity every time one of the people gets killed. Um, and the press seems to be almost like siding with them. So we need a group that will go out and agitate the streets and say, you know, we're for the mines. We like the mines. So they put up the money to hold rallies and rent halls and put on shows. And they'd actually rent the Amphidrome or D Stadium or whatever. And they'd, they'd, they'd bring in bands and they'd say, tomorrow all of our workers can have the day off, come out to a rally. There's going to be bands playing and free beer. Next thing you know, there's 5,000 people all there clamoring that the union's got to go. So you, they'd ask you to sign this pledge saying that you agree the Western Federation of Miners is opposed to good government and the Western Federation of Miners must go. And you often encounter that language around this time frame. Whenever someone's talking against the union, they're often using violent language and they're also talking about ejecting people or throwing them out of the country or removing them from the country or, or, or deporting them from the country. And when you physically remove somebody against their will, it's kidnapping. They never use that word, though. But they'll talk about, you know, these people must go. But the Citizens Alliance plays into it because they would ask their members to wear a pin that says Citizens Alliance on it. And this is an actual Citizens Alliance pin. Uh, they came in different sizes, but they're always white with red lettering on them. And that plays into the story as well. So on Christmas Day, 1913, the um, Western Federation of Miners decided to hold a party for the children of the striking miners. And Big Annie Clements was actually the organizer of it. She was the head of the Women's Auxiliary of the Western Federation of Miners. And as you might guess, the strike had started in July, was still happening in December. There was no movement on the side of mine management, despite the fact that everybody in pretty much the world thought the mines were being obstinate. So they said, okay, let's at least have a party for the children. So they got word out in the community that there's going to be a party for the children uh, on, on Christmas Eve. It started about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, upper floor of the Italian Hall. There will be presents, there will be candy, there will be singing. Santa Claus will be there, Christmas tree, caroling, that kind of stuff. Soon, hundreds of people start showing up. They believe that there may have been as many as six or 700 people in the hall by the time it was over. And the interesting thing about this is that if you uh, were to look at a cross-section of the ages of the people in the hall, they were probably about 10 to 1 children to adults. So it's not uncommon for one parent to bring his or her children along with, say, the neighbor's kids. Uh, and and may, maybe not quite 10 to 1, but 8 or 9 to 1. Uh, a lot of children and a few adults. So if you were to come to the Italian Hall, on Christmas Eve, you'd go up these stairs, through these doors, and then a very, very steep staircase going up. One of the things that persists in the story of the Italian Hall is people often talk about the doors opening the wrong way. The doors had nothing to do with it, and they did not open the wrong way, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you came to the top of that flight of stairs, this is what would greet you, is a landing at the top, a ticket room, ticket window, and a set of double swinging doors that would enter into the hall. If you step through those doors, 
On your right hand side are the seven windows facing the street. On your left hand side is the stage. And in the hall, there was theater seating, theater seating towards the front, which I'm talking about chairs that are bolted to the floor. And in the back half, there were just folding chairs and tables. But the hall was extremely crowded and also extremely noisy. There's testimony later that many people who were in the hall had stepped out onto this landing here or even in, in the ticket room because it didn't require a ticket to get into the hall. So the ticket room wasn't being used. People were standing out here simply to get out of the noise. People would come in from the outside and it, the hall itself is, is hot, it's noisy. And so around 4.40 in the afternoon, a man came in from the outside, climbed up the steep staircase, walked through those doors, stepped in the hall, and yelled fire loudly twice in the English language. And he yelled fire, and the moment he did that, it caused a panic. And the cry was repeated throughout the hall. There were people who heard it in English, but they spoke Croatian and repeated it in Croatian, or again, repeated in Finnish. There were people standing near the stage who said, I didn't see or hear the man who cried fire, but I heard other people who cried fire who were simply repeating it because they had heard it. But it caused a massive panic, and human nature is that if you are panicked and trying to run away, you're likely going to run the way you came. So if an alarm went off right now, most of us would go towards that exit. Now, some of you might see that exit there and go for that one also. But there were no other exits marked in the Italian Hall. The only exit anyone knew about was these doors, they had all come in. So everyone heads to those doors. If you come through those doors and make a sharp left, you cannot see down the stairs until it's too late. Because there's a blind wall. There's a wall here that creates a hallway down to the coat room. So you would have to step into the landing and turn left before you could see what was going on in the stairs. And what happened was, as the first group of people ran out, the first few people down the stairs made it. Somebody tripped and fell on the stairs. And in a group that large, with that many children, somebody trips and falls, and more people are coming from behind, pushing and shoving. Pretty soon, people are falling on the stairs, piling up on top of one another. And very, very quickly, there's about 100 people piled up in the staircase, 73 of whom would die, 59 were children, more than half were Finns. So you have that happen between 4.40 and 4.45 p.m. Christmas Eve, 1913. A photographer in Calumet named William Nara, who was a Finn, ran a portrait studio in town, and he went out and grabbed a camera and went around and documented a lot of the Italian hall disaster the next day. This is the interior of the hall taken Christmas morning, and this is from a stereo view slide, so you'll notice there's actually a cut here and the second rendition of the exact same photograph. I have the stereo view card and I've scanned it. Um, you can actually find a higher resolution of this elsewhere, but I, I like this because you'll notice, number one, it's got the subtitle here in Finnish. William Naro recognized that because of the heavy loss of life in the Finnish community, that this event would be very, very big in the Finnish community. But you'll also see some other things in the photograph that are worthwhile noting. There's a Christmas tree on the stage, there's a piano, and you'll notice the bright light coming in the windows because it's daytime, it's the next day. There's an abandoned baby carriage there on runners, a, a cutter, they'd call that, and folding chairs uh, scattered about the floor. And that just speaks to the confusion. When the first rescuers got on the scene, they couldn't get into the building through the staircase because it was jammed, but they could get the doors open, which is important though. So they went around the fire escape on the side of the building, came in and started pulling people off the top. And of course, if you're on top of the pile, you didn't get hurt. Pulling people off the top, they found people in the pile who were unconscious, and they found people in the pile who were dead. They were bringing people in and laying them out in the hall, laying them out on tables. There are stories of people who were laid on tables who recovered, people who were sat in chairs who were dead. Um, eventually, they get the whole mess untangled, and they realize that they've got a catastrophe on their hands. Underneath the stage was a kitchen. The hall actually had a very strange configuration. Uh, and so directly above this is, th this is actually the stage. And this window is in the back of the building here. And somebody kicked that window out because on the back of the building was an iron ladder that ran down the back of the building. And so you often hear about people who got out of the Italian hall by going off the fire escape onto the house next door because there's a balcony right even with the fire escape. Or people who climbed down ladders. And I know a lot of people who confuse that and think that the firemen showed up with ladders. Um, but I'm not sure that the firemen actually got anybody using ladders. I think the references to ladders are people climbing down the back of the building. Um, but this is the kitchen area. People in the kitchen could not have heard the cry of fire. 
except that it was repeated and somebody ran down in here and said there's a fire and <coughs> spread the panic underneath the kitchen. So you'll notice the kitchen likewise is absolutely trashed. Again, there's the uh, copyright mark for J.W. Nara of Calumet. So the firemen responded very quickly. There was a fire call box on the street right in front of the Italian Hall. Somebody grabbed it and said, hey, there's a fire at the Italian Hall. The firemen showed up very quickly. If you go to Calumet today, you can find the old fire station on 6th Street, and as a crow flies, it's about 100 yards. They were there almost instantly. And some witnesses actually said that the firemen got there so quickly that they somehow thought that the firemen had, had been sent out before the fire call went up. Uh, but that's just simply how fast it was and people compressing things in their minds. So we have here a date, December 24th, 1913, 4.45 p.m. It's interesting because when people think of the uh, uh, Christmas Eve, you think of the night before Christmas. It's the afternoon before Christmas. And um, there have been some things written lately that discuss what time the Italian Hall disaster happened. And, well, the fireman showed up at 445. We know that it happened just minutes before that. So I'm guessing 440, 435, right around there. But it happened definitely after 4 o'clock. Um, you'll notice that they were there for three hours, despite the fact that there was no fire. So uh, these X's, in case you're curious, there were 17 firemen who responded. Every single volunteer fireman in Calumet showed up. And this is also the Red Jacket fire log. Um, Calumet was not actually called officially, was not called Calumet until later years. It was actually called Red Jacket, the village of Red Jacket at the time. Fire alarm, December 24th, 1913, Box 45, Italian Hall. Disaster, no fire. Christmas festival, children of Western Federation miners. Fire call and a stampede falling down stairway, all piling on top of one another at foot of stairs. 73 lives were crushed out, mostly children, about 10 grown persons. That's the first official report of the Italian Hall disaster. And what's interesting is that whenever a historian looks at an event and studies all of the records and all of the reports and all of the documents created that reflect it, some of the earliest reports are interesting because no one's got time to spin what's happening. So you'll notice that in the very first report, there is no fire, there is a fire call, and 73 people died. Uh, in later years, there are going to be people who argue and say there may have been a fire, there may not have been a cry of fire, or we don't know how many people died. But those all three appear very quickly in the first report from that night. I apologize for showing this, but this is a famous photograph. William Nara went to the makeshift morgue at the Red Jacket uh, Town Hall and photographed some of the victims. And that was one of the things about the event is that that many people dying in that short period of time overwhelmed uh, their ability to do everything such as simply bury the dead. They had to send a call out to other communities saying, we need children's caskets because they needed 59 of them. And they didn't have that many in stock. So this is a photograph of the Italian Hall taken on Christmas Day. You notice the flag is at half staff. And you'll also notice that there's a very, very light snow covering on the ground. And that actually plays into the story because of the fact that the mines had hoped that a good, harsh Upper Peninsula winter might force the workers back. And they didn't get that harsh winter. At least they hadn't gotten it yet. And it was not snowing at that point in time. Very little snow on the ground. And so the local newspapers picked up the story. You'll notice the number does get in flux as down people died. We get 80 people here. The Daily Mining Gazette was the local newspaper that's still up there. And it's kind of funny because they, they know I make fun of them, but I know some people over there today and they don't seem to mind because they're kind of like, well, that's the old gazette. But the Daily Mining Gazette was in the hip pocket of the mines, and by that I mean literally they would get bribes. When they wrote good stories about the mines, um, the writers or editors would get cash gifts from the mines saying thank you for that good story about us. So the Daily Mining Gazette covers the Italian Hall disaster and points out that there's this horrible tragedy which we'll never solve. It could never be solved. I mean, it's been two days, so we can never solve it. <laughs> Charles Moyer, however, is using this to his benefit. So there are news organizations today who are accused of spinning things. The Daily Mining Gazette was a master of it. Because who would have thought that in your first paper that's going to mention the Italian Hall disaster, the first paper, you're going to have a sub-headline about how bad Charles Moyer is and how he's somehow behind this. Uh, but that's what they do. They, they, they start spinning it, saying somehow this is all the union's fault. 
Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that every different ethnic group had its own opinion about what happened. This is the Finnish newspaper, and I always like to tell people this is how we learn to speak Finnish. You guess what this word means? <laughs> 83 murdered, exclamation point. And I'm going to butcher this, but I'll do my best. Calumet Christmas Festival becomes cruel sacrifice to capitalism, is what the subhead says here. Now, Tuomi's newspaper, I'm mispronouncing it, and I apologize, I cannot say it correctly. I don't speak Finnish well enough. Um, Tuomi's newspaper means worker. And the worker is obviously a pro-worker newspaper. It's also very socialist in its leanings, and it's very, very uh, on the side of the unions. But they had actually spoken to people who said that they saw the man who cried fire wearing a citizen's alliance pin. And there were witnesses who said the man was wearing a white pin with red lettering and citizen's alliance. So they published this newspaper immediately, this article immediately, and they blamed it on a citizen's alliance hooligan. And when they put this article out, the sheriff went to their headquarters in Hancock and arrested them all and threw them in jail. So the First Amendment does not apply to a Finnish newspaper. It's the only rule I can get from that, and I'm an attorney. The Detroit News uh, is a good example of how coverage changed as you moved out of the area. So if you look at the newspaper coverage in Calumet in the English language, it's an unsolvable tragedy, which is probably the union's fault. If you look at the local ethnic newspapers, it was a tragedy probably caused by mine management. But as you got out of the area, the coverage got a little more balanced. This is the Detroit News, man who cried fire, children die, and it's a pretty straightforward report of what they knew at the time as to what happened. So the tragedy happens, 73 people are dead. Most people would think that looks like a crime. Charles Moyer is at a hotel in Hancock called the Scott Hotel, and he starts sending out telegrams, and this is one of his telegrams that survives. He mailed this to Woodbridge Ferris, and Lansing Woodbridge Ferris, of course, is the governor. They named the university after him. He describes the disaster, and he says it demands immediate investigation. He doesn't blame it on anyone. He does not point any fingers. He doesn't say anybody's behind this. He simply says, would you please investigate? He sends the same telegram substantially to the president, to his congressmen, to senators, to anybody you can think of saying, we've got 70 people dead, I think it calls for an investigation. Because of that, and I apologize, this is the, the picture I like to put up at the Scott Hotel. This is what it looks like today, more or less. In 1913, this was the nicest hotel north of Chicago. And that's where Charles Moyer stayed. That's also where they had presidents stay there. All kinds of famous people stayed there. And he was staying here when he got word of the Italian Hall disaster. So he's sending out the telegrams, and the sheriff shows up at his hotel room, knocks on the door, and enters it with a contingent of local important people. There's mayors from the local town, uh, some very well-known businessmen, and the sheriff, and he says to him, he says, in essence, we need you to stop your agitating. Stop sending out telegrams, stop doing that. We need you basically to shut up. And uh, Charles Moyer says, well, I'm not gonna do that. And the sheriff says, well, if you're not gonna cooperate with us, I can't protect you anymore. And the sheriff in 1913 saying he can't protect you anymore is such an understatement that it probably didn't bother Charles Moyer. And he just said, okay, well, whatever you gotta do. Sheriff leaves and two minutes later, a group of men burst in his room wearing Citizens Alliance pins, all of them sheriff's deputies, most of them are strike breakers. And they grab him and they beat him up, they shoot him, and they drag him bleeding from a bullet wound in the back of his neck out the building, and those of you familiar with the area will know this, down the hill, across the bridge, over to the train station, and they throw him on a train with two guys who go along with him, and they say, if you ever come back to Michigan, we'll kill you. We know the names of the men who did this to him. They were published in the newspaper the next day. Not a single one of them was charged with a crime. Because apparently if you do that to Charles Moyer, it's not against the law. So. They did that to Moyer for a couple of reasons. One is they wanted to silence him because he was sending out the telegrams requesting for an investigation. But number two, the funerals of the children were coming up. The funerals are going to be a massive spectacle because a lot of the newspapers and other journalists who've been in the area investigating and studying the strike 
it showed up in July and it left in August or September because things had gotten slow and it wasn't going anywhere. Well, guess what? On Christmas Day, many of the journalists were on the first trains back to the area to cover the strike and they wanted to cover the funerals. And the funerals turned out to be a massive, spectacular thing covered by the media and local newspapers and national newspapers. And to keep this in perspective, the Italian Hall disaster itself was front page news of the New York Times, Christmas Day, 1913. So this is a famous funeral photograph. They were, had to have funerals at six or seven different churches simultaneously to process that many victims. There are, I believe, 12 coffins in this photograph. The white coffins are for children. The black coffin is an adult, singular, because that's how many children there were to adults in most of these churches and their ceremonies. This is the Pine Street Apostolic Lutheran Church. It's still there, but it's no longer being used as a church. But you can notice, recognize it because of this curved altar. And a lot of photographs are taken here. This is another William Nara photograph. But you'll also find a lot of photographs taken of the funerals by other newsmen who'd come in specifically to cover this. So Charles Moyer cannot speak at the funerals, but other people would speak at the funerals. So you had 73 people being um, taken care of at funerals. Uh, this is another photograph of caskets coming out of the Pine Street Apostolic Lutheran Church. Someone sent me this photograph because they had a relative. It's their great uncle Buck was acting as a pallbearer. Um, and I like this photograph. But one of the things about these photographs is that they, uh, for the most part, carried, physically carried the caskets. The white caskets in particular would often have four miners carrying them. It's about a two mile walk from the Pine Street Apostolic Lutheran Church to the cemetery. Uh, now they had some of them that were in vehicles and then also there's wheeled vehicles but this is the only automobile and some of the newspapers mentioned that there's even a single automobile in the procession which in 1913 is kind of newfangled um, but it's a long haul out to the cemetery and a lot of the photographs you'll also see there were thousands of people and the, the estimates of how many people actually showed up for the uh, funerals vary wildly but there were probably 10,000, 15,000 people would come into town specifically to watch the funerals. So if you go to the Lakeview Cemetery where all 73 victims were buried, they actually had to bury them uh, in, a, in a hurry because of the short notice. In the Upper Peninsula, in the Kuanaw today, if someone dies, they often wait till spring to bury them because the ground is so hard. Well, it just so happens in Christmas 1913, you've got unemployed hard rock miners with nothing more important to do. So they went out to the cemetery and dug trench graves. There were at least three trench graves we know of, and they buried the victims out there. Now, you have to remember that William Nara is walking around with a glass plate camera on a tripod, and it's a big monstrosity he's got to set up. It takes 10 minutes per photograph. And he sets the camera up to take a photograph, and of course, as he's setting up, these guys here notice he's photographing the funeral. They did not necessarily look too happy about it, but we're glad he did, because otherwise there would be no record of this. But, um, this is one of the three trench graves. People ask me all the time, and if you're curious, I can direct you in the general location of these graves, but not all of them are marked. I'm guessing about half of the victims are not marked at the Lakeview Cemetery. They buried about half of them on the Protestant side, buried half of them on the Catholic side, um, and there was a massive uh, ceremony at graveside. Uh, it did not get terribly political, but there were a couple famous things set out there, including one a uh, man who was speaking and he was responding to the fact that the Western Federation of Miners had specifically said it wasn't looking for charity, did not want to accept charity from the Mines or from the Citizens Alliance, who had both offered charity to the victims. And he said, we're not looking for charity, we're looking for justice. Um, Clarence Darrow had been invited and asked to speak at the funerals and he declined saying he was worried that if he showed up in town, he would have gotten run out of town the same way they'd run Charles Moyer out of town. So the, they managed to accomplish their task of scaring people into inaction. There were at least three families that lost three children at the Italian Hall disaster. There were also couples where the husband and wife died and so on. Um, this is the three Clarich sisters. There's also the Mahalsic children where there were four Mahalsic children who went to the hall that night and only one of them came home. Um, there was also the Hakenen boys, all three of whom perished in the Italian Hall disaster. And not all of the graves are marked in any meaningful way to suggest that they are, in fact, Italian Hall victims. Some of the newer ones are. Um, 
uh, one hint though is if you find anybody out there who died on Christmas Eve 1913, you can find some graves that are marked and they're, uh, the graves are in other languages, the headstones are. And you can't read any of it unless you speak Croatian, except that you can see the date. And it's December 24th, 1913, it's the Italian Hall. So again, the 28th is when they bury the dead, for the most part, and we still don't know what happened at the Italian Hall. So the coroner decides to hold an inquest, and under Michigan law in 1913, any time somebody died and they were in a medically unattended situation, that is, if you died in a hospital and a doctor's at your side, the doctor can fill out your death certificate, say, here's how you died. If you died in a medically unattended me uh, way, or if you died violently or accidentally, the coroner was required to fill out a death certificate for you and to deem your death as either accidental, suicidal, or homicidal. Those are his three choices. So he's required for the 73 victims of the Italian Hall, because none of them died in a medically attended setting, he's required to fill out a death certificate and determine which of those three things in, in the manner of death. So I have actually got, it took some time, I've gathered up all 73 death certificates filled out by William Fisher, and I can assure you that this is identical to the other 72. William Fisher Coroner, who, by the way, had no medical training. Um, back then, you know, he was, he was also Justice of the Peace, and he had no legal training. So, the cause of death, and remember, he must, he must designate it as either accidental, suicidal, or homicidal. We know these people didn't commit suicide, so his only choices then are accident or homicide. Well, here's the cause of death. They were killed December 24th, 1913, Kelly Nutt, in a jam caused through an alarm of fire during a children's gathering at the Italian Hall. No mention of whether it's an accident or a homicide. He comes to that conclusion after taking testimony from 70 witnesses over three days at the village hall. Half the witnesses were not in a position to see anything. He didn't call witnesses who did see what happened. The questioning is horrible. Uh, it doesn't ask follow-up questions. Someone will actually be halfway through a sentence and they'll get asked another question. But none of them were provided interpreters. Many of them did not speak English. The, one of the first witnesses is an Italian man who, if you read his testimony, it's almost funny because he's asked questions in English and he's answering in broken English, which if they did it on TV today, they'd get in trouble for stereotyping somebody as being a stupid Italian. It's bad. And yet, we know at Sieberville, they brought in five interpreters to interpret the Finnish, the Hungarian, the Croatian. Here they've got witnesses who could, who, who, some of them actually did see what happened, but they don't want to know what happened. So you got to ask yourself why Fisher would do that. Um, I believe he didn't want to know the truth because they, everybody knew what the truth was. The truth was the guy who yelled fire was a strike breaker. Uh, and they probably knew who he was, and I discussed that in the book. So um, after he takes testimony for three days with no interpreters, they come to the conclusion, and he actually writes an opinion that they attach to the inquest transcript. And in his opinion, he says, um, the cry of fire was raised by someone in the hall, but we don't know who. Well, okay, we, we could have gotten that from the newspapers. But he fills out 73 death certificates, and not in a single one does he ever mention whether or not it's an accident or homicide. So he completely, completely skips his only duty in that case. A lot of people talk about the Italian Hall disaster and say, well, you know, when the Italian Hall disaster happened, it brought the community together. And, this, and the union missed the opportunity to, 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 as a healing moment, where they could have come to my management and said, you know, take us back and, and let's just all be you know, bygones be bygones. And that's not actually true. I found this letter recently, and it's a letter written to Jim McNaughton on behalf of some uh, loyal workers who are asking him on December 31st, three days after the victims are on the ground, and he's saying, would you kindly kick out the strikers from the company houses so we can give the houses to loyal workers? <coughs> so the idea that everyone's all touchy-feely after the Italian Hall disaster, it's not the case. So the Italian Hall disaster gets marked down officially as unsolvable, uh, not a crime, um, and that's basically what happens. So the hall winds up just going on. Uh, it winds up being knocked down in 1984. And we were discussing earlier People who grew up in this area of Calumet in the 40s and 50s, this building was used for many, many years for other purposes. I've spoken to people who attended wedding receptions there, uh, high school reunions, 
um, they used to hold teen dances there on the weekends. I met a guy about a month ago who said, I attended several dozen teen dances there and didn't know it was the Italian hall, because it was, it was often just referred to as the hall where they had the dances. But there were some concerns that the hall was unsafe. There was a, an, an industrial band-aid here because there was a crack forming in the wall. Also crack above this window caused that window to break. And so some people were concerned that the building was unsafe. Um, the guy who owned the building bought it at a tax auction for I think two or three thousand dollars, and he offered to give it to the village for free if they wanted it. And the village brought in an architect who studied it and said, if you want to bring the building up to code and open it back up for use, it's going to cost maybe a hundred thousand dollars. The village didn't have the money, so the village actually told Delbert Master who owned it, "Thank you for the offer, but we don't want the building." So instead, the building got knocked down. I do like to point out to people though, here's the fire escape, which you could not see in earlier pictures because there used to be a house on this lot here. The house is now gone. It's gone by 1984 as well. And that's the fire escape that many of the first responders went up and in to come down and to take care of the people who were jammed in the staircase. A couple things that I like to point out is that I wrote my book originally in 2006. And I've been doing a lot of talks. In fact, I spoke here, I think, six years ago. Um, and when the book came out, and I've had many people come up to me after reading the book and say, you know, that reminded me, or I wanted to talk to you because I've got a story. And one of the stories I've, I've heard over and over again is about the Niemelas, Finnish couple, who were found in the stairwell dead, but their baby had survived. And uh, William Nara actually published the story on the little stereo slides and pointed out that uh, little uh, Reno Oscar Niemela had survived, and the story was that he was being held over the parents' heads, and they had passed away, but he lived because of that heroic act. We don't know if that's true or not, it's a great story. But he did live, and I mentioned that in the book. And about a year and a half ago, I was speaking <clears throat> in Florida, and a woman came up to me, and she, says, she said, I know all about Oscar, uh, or Ray, as, 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 as he was known. She was. I know the family who adopted him, and, and we knew the family very, very well. I said, really? And she told me some stories about him, and, it was, and, and I've since confirmed that they're true. And she said, and I can get you a photograph of him. And so here is little Ray. was <laughs> <laughs> the couple who adopted him. And interestingly enough, on his left, or the far right of the picture, is the pastor from the Pine Street Apostolic Lutheran Church who oversaw the funeral of his parents. And I'm not sure what the occasion of the photograph is, but she got me the photograph, she goes, that is Ray. And I spoke to people later, and Ray went on to work in the auto industry in Detroit. He lived in Oakland County, was living in um, Waterford into his late 80s. Um, uh, you know, so that would be the 1990s, and then he passed away. And he lived a very long and, and fruitful life. And then, of course, um, I mentioned earlier Big Annie. Big Annie, most of us knew that after the strike ended, she got divorced and moved to Chicago. And that's all we ever knew. And a guy named Lyndon Comstock, a woman named Joanne Wilson, uh, did a ton of work um, trying to figure out whatever became of him or her. And so they tracked down both where she came from and where she went. And among other things, they found her great-granddaughter living in Chicago. And they got her on the phone and said, we're doing research on your great-grandmother. And she said, why? And they said, well, do you know who your great-grandmother was? And they said, she goes, yeah, her name was Anna Clements. She lived in Chicago. They said, no, do you know what she did before she was in Chicago? She said, no, I don't. Did not know that her great-grandmother was Big Annie of the Calumet Copper Strike. So as they were explaining to her the importance of her great-grandmother, they said, do you have any photographs of her? And she said, no, I don't have anything. I wish I did, but I don't. About a week later, she called back and she said, actually, I found a suitcase full of photographs. We don't know who they're of. Going through the photographs, it turns out every single one is of Big Annie at some point in her life. So this is Big Annie. In later years, Annie's daughter Dot, Annie's two grandchildren, one of those being the parent of the woman on the phone saying she didn't know who Big Annie was. Big Annie actually, after moving to Chicago, remarried. Her husband died, she remarried a third time. And one of the photographs in the collection of photographs in the suitcase is of Big Annie at her third wedding and she's standing at the base of the staircase, and her husband's on the second step. <laughs> and, uh, he is still shorter than her. <laughs> it's a great photograph. And, um, but Big Annie did go on, and the interesting thing, though, is that the grand, great-granddaughter did say, 
that um, as they asked around and as the people did research, uh, Big Annie, after moving to Calumet, did not talk much about the strike and never mentioned the Italian Hall. Big Annie was the one who organized the Italian Hall. She was on stage when the cry of fire went up. She testified at the inquest, and the local newspapers absolutely pilloried her and blamed it all on her. And so on some level, she must have felt guilty. It wasn't her fault, but it was her party. So on some level, that must have really weighed on her. But we do see that she went on and had a very good life, and um, that's her with her uh, child and grandchildren. So that gets us back to the Italian Hall site. I do need to tell you this, though. At the end of my book, I point out that the historical marker on the site, which was placed in the 1980s, has a mistake in it and says the doors opened the wrong way. And when my book first came out in 2006, I mentioned the doors opened the wrong way. And I was speaking in Lansing shortly after the book came out. A woman came up to me and gave me her card and said, I understand you think there's a mistake in my marker. And she was the head of the department that does the markers. And I said, well, there is. So we went back and forth. Anyway, she said, what should the marker say? And so I rewrote the marker as, as how I thought it should say. And she submitted that to the people in Calumet, and they refused to change the marker. They said, we do not want to change the marker. It'll upset people. And so the way I had drafted the marker, I don't mention the doors, because the doors are irrelevant. The people didn't get to the doors. The, the problem was caused by people falling on a staircase. It was not the doors. As this year approached, Somebody in Lansing contacted the people in Calumet and said, if you don't change the marker, we're going to take it down and remove it because the markers are owned by the state. So they finally said, yes, we'll replace the marker. So June of this year, the marker was replaced. So if you go out there today, you'll see a marker that talks about the Italian Hall, talks about the contacts, and simply sidesteps the issue of the doors. One of the problems that we had is when we talk about the Italian Hall, if you talk to people in Calumet and say, what do you think the problem was? They go, the doors opened the wrong way. And it became a legend in the community. And if you try to tell people that they were wrong, one of the first things to say is, well, no, no, no. It's on the marker. So it's not on the marker anymore. So we got that fixed. So the other problem we have is now people are saying there wasn't a cry of fire. We have people saying maybe there actually was a fire. There was no fire, but there was a cry of fire. And the man who cried fire was doing it to break the party up. And that's what all the evidence shows, a very, very strong circumstantial case. That's what that's all about. So if you have any questions or comments, I can talk all night. And um, if you want a book, I got books for sale also. I'll give you five bucks off tonight. And um, I'll take credit cards, by the way. So. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. This is the second time you were here showing this movie, isn't it? In town? Yes. I got some new slides. I hope you noticed okay. that. The reason I'm asking was, at the time, I had the impression that the doors were locked or chained. That's why they couldn't get out. No, 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 no. When I heard that, I heard yeah, that. I heard that. Right. Yeah, no, no, of course you did. But the photograph on the cover of my book was taken Christmas morning, but that shows the doors open the correct way, okay? But there was testimony given at the coroner's inquest by firemen who said, we got there, we could open the doors up, we could even reach people on the stairs, but we couldn't pull them out because of the weight pressing down on top of them. Not a single person ever testified that the doors were shut, held shut, chained shut, nothing. The doors opened freely. It had nothing to do with it. It's in my mind. I hear. I heard that they were chained or locked. But that, that wouldn't have been me. Well, somebody that I. Okay, but I'm gonna say it's because it's, it's I would never have said that. It's, that that's certainly not the case. It's a common story. It's a that's common story. Because that's what I heard. Yeah. About. Yes, I actually spent. I actually discussed in the book. I spent about six months trying to figure out where it started. The first time the story appears in print of the doors opening the wrong way is 1943. <laughs> I'm sorry, 1953, 40 years after the event, in a book by C. Harry Benedict called Red Metal. Prior to that, no one ever mentioned it. I can show you the Calumet News newspaper from 1908. The building was built in 1908 to replace the hall that burned down in 1907. In 1908, when the building was put up, the Calumet News said that the building is modern and has all outward opening doors. And the reason that was put in the story was that in 1903, there was a fire in Chicago at the Iroquois Theater where 600 people died in the building when the doors did open the wrong way. Building codes were changed in 1903. I've had people tell me, oh, the Italian Hall is why they changed the building codes. The building codes were changed more than five years before the Italian Hall was, was, was disaster happened and several years before it was built. So there's no way they would have built this building the wrong way. There's no way. So, yes? Any rumors of a deathbed confession? 
There's two deathbed confessions that are reported, both by the Daily Mining Gazette. The Daily Mining Gazette's an interesting entity in that they publish a deathbed confession, and several years later they pu publish another one without mentioning the first one. Yeah. I debunked them both and explained why there's big, big holes in both of them. I actually tracked down the reporter who wrote the second one okay. and asked him about it. He got very, very angry with me and said he didn't want to talk about it. I personally think he made the story up. I don't think there's, I don't, I don't even think there was a deathbed confession, but if there was, it was fake. Okay. So, yes. There's a famous folk song about the Italian home. 1913 Massacre by Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie. Yes, and it's relatively accurate. He's got a couple things wrong. He says the miners were made less than a dollar a day, which is actually made three bucks a day. He says the doors were held shut. Not the open, but they were held shut, which is not the case. And he also says that there were um, strike breakers sitting outside laughing while they were untangling the bodies, which is probably not true either. But Woody Guthrie is basing that story on the rendition of the event that Ella Reeve Bloor wrote in a book called We Are Many. He read that book and was so moved by it, he decided to write a pro-labor song about it. So as far as that goes, he got a lot of the spirit of the story right, but his facts were not that terribly, terribly straight. So. Yes? I know one of the, uh, the other kind of common stories was that it was uh, a teenager or a couple of teenagers that actually cried fire. I, it's not usually said teenagers. They usually say it was somebody playing a prank or somebody yeah. playing a hoax. Um, and that's one of those stories that you also see pop up from time to time, but you never see it pop up in any of the places that matter. So for instance, there was a coroner's inquest, then there was a, a, a subcommittee that took testimony from you know Washington, and at neither of those hearings did anybody ever say any other explanation other than this guy ran in, yelled fire, and ran out. So some of those other stories they do pop up, but you don't know where they started from. So you know it makes you wonder. I don't know. I mean I've heard all kinds of crazy stories. Yeah. You know, and so the trick is to weed through all the stories and find the ones that make the most sense and have the most support. And there's 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 no support that I know of for that story other than yeah I heard that someplace. Then it's, that's one of the ones that you hear from time to time. There's also stories reported that the man who yelled fire had alcohol in his breath. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how many people would be that close to him to smell the alcohol. But interestingly enough, that was reported in the New York Times. <laughs> so, I mean, some of these stories actually had some traction, but they very quickly disappeared. So. The Chicago article looked like it maybe had names listed of the uh, injured, the dead. Yes, the, 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 the victims um, were identified very quickly, um, and the earliest lists were not terribly accurate. So there were lists of the dead that had like 78 or 80 names on them. And I talk about that in the book because I actually think there were five victims that were not listed in the death certificates. But we do know the names of all the 73 who died. We have the death certificates, their full names, and all that information. Um, so yeah, the, the, the names were listed in the newspapers. Some of the earliest, like the Calumet News, actually listed addresses. And said, you know, so and so of, of you know, Seven Waterworks Street, Red Jacket, you know. So, is there a question up here somewhere? Yeah, how yeah. did you get interested in this? What, what caught your attention to start delving into it? I, I read a chapter in a book, there's a book called Boom Copper by Angus Murdoch. And he has one chapter in Italian Hall, he wrote it in 1943. And I read that chapter and thought, there's got to be more about this now since it's been 60, 70 years since he wrote this. And there wasn't. So I started investigating and Okay. Wrote the book. Yeah. So. Anything else? Okay. Oh, yes. How come they never did a movie of it? You mean it's not done? It? You know, I've actually been. I actually was approached by a guy who had a screenplay. I talked to him. There um, is one documentary recently made called 1913 Massacre, which is about this event, but it's told from a slightly different viewpoint. I, I know the guy very well who made the documentary. And there is going to be a documentary about this on PBS on December 17th. Oh. I consulted on it. That's how I know that. So December 17th, nationwide, PBS, wherever you are, December 17th, 9 o'clock, the documentary is called Red Metal. Uh, the subtitle is um, The Italian Hall and the Copper Strike or something like that, but it's Red Metal. And so, but you're right, it would make a great document, uh, a great drama. You could, you could, it could be, you know, Big Annie could be the protagonist. You know, I, you know, um, we need to find a tall actress for her, but you know, so. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.